Alright, what's up guys? Welcome to the first official episode of the year. So it's like third weekend of January and I actually haven't filmed a video or taken a photo at all this year. Unless you count that awesome sunrise that I took a picture of driving myself to the ER. <laughs> Does that count? Um, so my shoulder's still messed up, as some of you may know, and this is sketchy at best, so camera lady has her eye on me in case anything goes wrong. She can carry me on her back to the nearest hospital, which is conveniently across the street from my house. <laughs> so we're doing this here tonight. I don't want to go far, but it's new moon. It's super clear outside. There's not a, in classic New Mexico style, there's not a cloud in the sky. My house, I'm lucky that I live in a mountain town, very small very high elevation. Um, I have a 270 degree view of the sky. So we're going to go for Orion and I'm going to go on my tracker and I'm going to go through the whole process. That's the downside to driveway shooting is we're going to have to deal with cars driving by. Okay, so uh, what do we got? So first of all, we have, I'm going to I want to, I'm trying to come up with a nice light travel solution, uh, and this is good practice. So I'm rolling with my R7 uh, and not my R6 Mark II or my R6 or my R5, all of which are technically much better of a camera than this, and the 70 to 200 F4. So what I love about this lens for Astro is that it's super light and super compact, which means I can just take it anywhere. Uh, and on this R7, which the reason why I'm picking R7 is because that's going to natively put this with the crop with the crop factor. That's going to put this to 320 millimeters, which is going to get me a bit closer to Orion. So we're going to get this guy set up. This is my uh, Star Adventurer 2i, uh, and I have the the Pro package. So this thing is great because it'll fit in any of my regular camera photo backpacks and it'll fit with, you know, the rest of my gear. This is a really great portable system. So the important bits of doing this, so first of all, having the driveway is nice because I have the concrete and it's level. So I always want to make sure I'm level first. The next thing is we're going to get polar aligned. This is not going to be a polar alignment tutorial because I just don't have that kind of energy right now. I'm going to go ahead and get polar aligned. Um, but what I will say is that once you get polar aligned, it is the utmost importance that you do not move or bump this setup in any way, shape or form at all. Don't even breathe funny near it. And that is more true the longer the focal length you're going to be using. So make sure you have a sturdy enough tripod, which this is iffy, <laughs> but this is all I have right now. Um, so yeah, let me get polar aligned and then I'll walk you through getting my setup. So I've got this polar line now, and this is the sucky part for any astrophotographer. <laughs> so I'm doing a couple of things that are a little sketchy. The first thing is I'm not going to use a counterbalance. Um, normally on telescopes and star trackers and stuff, you have a big weights that you put on and they'll help balance it for the motor to turn easier. But I know that my system is light enough to get away with just mounting the ball head straight to here. And I really, that's another reason why I really wanted to find a portable system is because I really prefer that. It, it makes, first of all, it makes traveling a lot easier, but second of all, it makes uh, your compositions a lot easier. And whatever ball head you're using, make sure it's strong, like strong enough to handle whatever weird ways you're gonna put this in. So, um, then what we do is we loosen this and we're going to get it pointed roughly in the direction of Orion. So the reason why we want to use a ball head is because 
now you see how I can orient, right? Because if you're using the counterweight, you have to move, you have to undo the clutch, which is this main gear that's holding this whole assembly. And then you have to, uh, then you're very limited with how you can rotate with once, once the camera is attached to the thingy uh, with the weights. And I just, I don't like messing with it if I don't have to. So this was instrumental in me finding something uh, that allows me to not have to do that. What I'm hoping for is like at least one to two minute exposures. So, and that's really going to depend on uh, your polar alignment and how good you are. If you got a sucky polar alignment, it's, and that's also going to depend on your focal length. The longer the focal length, the more important it is to just seriously spot on nail your polar alignment. All right, so once I find where I'm at at 70, I'm going to zoom in all the way to 200. And now because of focus breathing and focal length, I'm going to recheck my focus. And then I'm gonna go ahead and switch this to manual focus. So I'm gonna go ahead and take uh, a 30 second shot, ISO 6400 and just see what it looks like. And it, mostly we're checking for focus here. But I'm also checking to see if we can get to start, if we can get a 30 second one, that's decent. Okay, that's looking better. So the wonkiness that you see here is the light pollution and that's the light flare that's, that's hitting my lens from the light that's filming me. So I'm gonna turn that off in a little bit. But the important bit is that we can see Orion. And if I zoom in here, I am gonna go with, that's pretty darn good for focus. Okay, so now what we need to do is I'm going to switch it to bulb mode. So I'm going into bulb timer, enable, and I'm gonna go for one minute. Okay, that's going. So we'll check back in a minute. Okay, that is looking much better. All right, so I went straight from one minute to two minutes. So now we're doing a two minute exposure and we're gonna see how good my polar alignment is. I'm gonna be very happy if my polar alignment is solid because I only spent like less than five minutes on the polar alignment. So <laughs> if it's solid first try five minutes, I'm very happy. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the outside portion of this video so that I can turn this light off and take Popsicle Camera Lady inside and de-thaw her. Uh, and then we'll meet up in the studio after I get all this stuff and walk you through how many I ended up with, what we're gonna do with them, and how I'm gonna do the flats. So flats are very important and we're gonna talk about all that stuff inside where it's warm and I have some chai. So we'll see you in a second. Okay, so it's the next day, we're in the studio, we've got the chai, we've got the images. Um, like I said before, this isn't like a do the best that you can, like most amazing image I've ever created type of episode. I more wanted to see because I've never tried uh, doing this from my driveway in a city or a town or whatever in light pollution. So I genuinely just want to see like what we can come up with, what you can get out of it with just a, a mediocre setup. And I say that with like context and relativity in mind because this setup, the R7, 70 to 200 and the Star Tracker, um, you know, that's, it's under $4,000 and that is a lot of money. But again, in context and relativity compared to um, what you would need for just crazy Astro stuff, like really good Astro stuff, that's still, I think, if you're into photography and you're already doing a lot of stuff, chances are you've already got a DSLR or a mirrorless and some lenses like this laying around, so you would really only be out maybe a tracker and a, and a good tripod, you know, so that's the context there. And just with this mid-level stuff, I just want to see like what we can get 
by just staying in the comfort of my own house, really. So I couldn't have asked for better conditions other than the light pollution, of course, and I am kind of kicking myself that I didn't, I live in the mountains, you know, and 15 minutes outside of town, it is completely dark, like so much darker. And I kind of wish I wasn't lazy, but shoulders and, and heaters and cats and comfort. <laughs> So let's just go ahead and jump in and I will walk you through. I'm not gonna do a tutorial on the editing because again, I don't have the energy for that and I can't keep my shoulder propped up here like this for much longer. So I'm gonna run you through the edits that I already did and talk about a couple of things and hit on a few uh, notes for you know what it takes to process this kind of an image. And then I'll show you what I got and then uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so we're in Bridge, and the first thing that I did was I just put these guys in a folder, and then here are all of my test shots. Um, I took those all out, and then I put all the good usable shots that were the same settings after I dialed everything in. I finally settled on 75 seconds, ISO 1600 at f5.6. So I put those all into a folder, and then we come back here and we open up deep sky stacker and then i load my images in and then i open up my flats which i took here in the room uh, and then i open up those and then we and then we go through here and we register everything we go through the whole process and then after that stacks everything, it kicks out a TIFF file. And that is right here. So we're gonna start by opening up this TIFF file in Photoshop. All right, so I've already edited mine, like I said, but there's a couple of things that I wanna go over. The first thing that you gotta remember about TIFFs and uh, Deep Sky Stacker is that it's gonna kick out a 32-bit image. So the first thing you need to do is come up here to image and mode and then switch it to 16-bit because you can't really do anything in 32-bit as things don't like it. So the first thing that I do is you can mess with all this stuff if you want and try to you know piddle with getting a uh, whatever detail you want out of that. But I just come up here to exposure and gamma. I don't mess with anything and I hit OK. So now this is a 16-bit uh, image, and now we can start messing with it. Okay, so we're gonna take a look here. Let's turn off all of these layers, and I'll kind of go through them a little bit. Okay, so this is the base TIFF file. So the first thing that we need to do in astrophotography is we do something called stretching. All right, so let's start with a, the base image real quick again from scratch, just so you guys can visually understand this first part because this is kind of the important bit. So again, first thing we need to do is change the mode to 16-bit, go in here to exposure and gamma, and we're gonna hit okay. So now we're gonna come in here and we're gonna grab the levels layer. And this is showing our data. So we got a lot of data in a small area. So this is the darkest area of the, this is pure black and this is pure white. And this is normally you want a histogram that's like this, like in the middle. So we're gonna make it that way, which means we're gonna stretch this. We're gonna pull this data apart. So the first thing I'm gonna do is drag these blacks and the midtones over to represent uh, more of the data point. Okay, so now you can see just from the first one, you can look at the Orion Nebula here and you can see a lot more detail coming out. And then look over here at the horse head, which you can barely see, but now you can see it. And then the same with the Flame Nebula. So this is where our detail is at and it's telling us that the detail is in there. We just have to pull it out. So we're gonna come back and grab another one and do this again. So now you'll notice that it's twice as wide because we've stretched it. So now we're gonna do it again. We're gonna bring those blacks in and bring those midtones in. Okay, 
So now we're seeing even more data in the nebula, and don't worry about the wonkiness here that, that's going to happen. So then we're going to, I'm going to do it one more time. So I should, so that's looking a lot better. We've got a lot more nebulosity in here, and then we've got this other companion nebula coming out. We've got the horse head, the flame nebula. We've got the wonkiness here. So I suspect that a lot of this is uh, noise pollution, but then this area of the sky is naturally a lot darker and I was pointed kind of straight up. So that may account for some of this because I did do the flats and you'll notice that I don't have any crazy vignetting. If you don't do the flats, you're gonna have very bad vignetting and it's gonna make the light gradients weirder. So definitely do your flats. So what I like to do is I like to consider this my first stretching group. So I'm just going to select those control G for group and you can label it if you want to, but I don't really care. I, I know, I know what it is, you know? Um, so that's my first stretch. So now let's go back into, um, the already edited image so that you can see what we've done. That looks pretty darn similar to what I just did there. So I'm going to go ahead and close this one. So now that you know how the stretching works. So the next thing I did was create a stamp visible layer by control alt shift E. So that didn't do anything that just stamps the layer, makes a new layer and then puts all the information below it into that layer. So then I'm going to come up here. This is where I'm going to start working on a little bit of color. So we're going to tweak that until there's some better color there. And I used curves for that and I used the RGB. So you can see down here where I've pulled the reds, the greens and the blue channels to uh, fix that color a little bit. And you'll notice it's still a little wonky and maybe a little on the cool side, but it's much better than that. So everything in Astro is done in increments. It takes a long time. The next thing here is I created another stamp visible layer, but this time after the layer is open or created, I hit control shift and a, and that will bring up camera raw on my second screen, which is not recording. Okay. Bring that in. So that'll bring up camera raw inside of Photoshop, which I really love. And it's a very underrated feature that people don't utilize enough. But now we can work on things a little in here, things like fixing uh, this maybe. So we could come in here and do something like grab a brush or a radial um, and then fill that in. And then we can come down here and maybe say we want to brighten that up a little bit or we want to um, do some things like get rid of some of that magenta. So there's a lot of things we could do there. Uh, we can come in here and make a mask or whatever. So that's what I did there. So you can see the outside was still a bit uh, bright and I wanted to get it closer to this darkness. So I darkened that up a little bit, but you'll notice it's still pretty bad there. So the next thing I did was hue and saturation to get rid of all uh, at least a good chunk of um, the those magentas, which are color artifacting basically and from being pushed too hard. So we have that layer there. So the next thing I did was open up another stamp visible layer and open up camera raw again. But this time I did a little more um, brightening up on this center bit here. And I also added just a touch of clarity and uh, texture to the nebulae areas. So that's subtle. Now I want to start working on the color. So there's a bunch of different ways to do color. This is a very artistic choice and it's very subjective. So don't hound me for this, uh, but I'm using the channel mixer here and I'm just adding in some of these reds around the uh, horse nebula. And then inside the uh, Orion's nebula, adding in some of those reds. Uh, 
and then I'm using a selective color which is very similar um, but just another way to tweak color so I'm just doing that and I'm selecting these areas again just giving them a little more of what should be there that I couldn't capture with the setup that I had because it didn't have any H alpha filters or an astro modded sensor or anything like that. So I'm adding that color that I know should be there uh, back into it. So then the next thing we have is star reduction. So you'll see a lot of stars there and now they're gone. And again, this is extremely subjective, but for this case, I find it uh, the stars a little too distracting, especially through the nebula, especially because I didn't shoot the nebula as well. I didn't get as much data as I wanted on it. So taking them away, I think it helps and it hurts. So it definitely helps the clarity of the nebulae. And now you can see uh, Horsehead really well. You can see inside the flame and you can see all of this beautiful detail in Orion. So I chose to take those out uh, myself. And moving on, we have another stamp visible layer uh, that I opened up in Camera Raw again, and you'll see I brightened up this center bit because that's still bothering me that it's that dark. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and fix that and brighten it up a little bit. Next, we have another layer where I'm taking even more stars out because I got a little carried away and that's okay. The next layer is we have a little hue and saturation layer and I'm desaturating a lot of this because I, as I pushed it, the exposure, it generated more uh, color noise and so I took that out. And that way the color is a lot more emphasized in where I want it and not where I don't. So then we have another layer of yet again more stars taking out and again Maybe that's overboard, it's subjective. So, but that's what happened. <laughs> so next thing is a little global uh, layer here for just pulling down those mid-tones just a little bit. And I don't really know if that helped or hurt. And then that's pretty much it. Okay, so that in a nutshell, <laughs> in a very fast, uh, editing bit was what I did to the image and I will preface I should have prefaced this with um, I am not an astro a deep sky astrophotographer as much as I want to be I know a lot about astrophysics and I know a lot about cosmology having studied those as parts of my geology and chemistry degrees for many many years but there's a big difference in understanding that kind of stuff and being able to photograph it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm by no means anywhere near the level of other Astro YouTubers out there like, you know, Trevor from Backyard Astro or, uh, you know, Nebula Photos or Alan Wallace, any of those guys. Like, I'm, I'm not that. I'm just a regular guy, regular photographer with regular gear who would like to try this kind of stuff. And I figure that maybe there's other people out there like me too. So maybe this video and seeing what I'm doing, not having the background that they have or the equipment that they have or spending the time that they spend editing, all of that, I just want to kind of showcase the average. You know, this is average gear, average editing time and average knowledge of said gear and all of that stuff all coming together to hopefully maybe help you um, think that you should try this too, because you should. It's, it's uh, extremely frustrating and extremely rewarding because just there's, this is such a different type of photography from, you know, if you are new to my channel, then I do a lot of wildlife. I do a lot of um, regular astro, like wide field star earth astro, landscape astro. I do a lot of time lapses, uh, sports, I mean, all kinds of stuff, and I love all of that. But there's something so different about capturing things that you can't see right off the bat, you know, and then making those images come to life and then realizing that they're like light years away and that they're part of the cosmos. It's just mind blowing. So hopefully that just like maybe gives you enough uh, spark of motivation or excitement to try it yourself and know that I did this in my driveway in a light polluted area. Um, and you know, you can compare it with some of the stuff that I've done before with telescopes and bigger things like this, 
where I've gone into dark skies and I've gotten longer focal lengths and you know different images but there's just something to be said to running outside in the comfort of your own home and trying this and it's just super fun so give it a go let me know what you think in the comments down below uh, like I said I know it wasn't the best image in the world but for what it was I'm pretty happy with it and I think that uh, anybody capturing this kind of stuff from their driveway would be stoked to get something like this and I certainly am so yeah comments down below if you're still here after that super long episode I really appreciate it definitely hit that like button for me that's the best thing you do for the channel I've got channel memberships too if you're interested in further supporting I do have some longer edit videos on that and I do do that more often on the channel members uh, so if you want to see like longer full scale editings for like how I do the my Milky Ways or whatever I'm editing at the time, you know, um, there's a bunch of channel perks there. You can check that out and it definitely helps support me. So I super appreciate it. All right, that's enough talking. I'm gonna go ice my shoulder, check on my doctor's appointments and drink the rest of this tea. And hopefully I will be out and about sometime soon because I'm getting really bored and frustrated with not being able to resume regular photography. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.